Hey y'all, how's it going? Hope you enjoyed the penguin videos. I know I loved filming them, I loved working with the penguins. It was absolutely like the best week or so of my life, just out there chasing penguins the whole time. And it seems like you enjoyed it based on the questions. So as you can tell, backgrounds changed a lot. My mom can attest that I constantly reorganize things and change things around. But then I'm gonna try to keep it this way with like books and field equipment over here. And I'm gonna have like a saying or a little tidbit of information uh, in each of the videos right here. So this one, Kaitia Kotonga Hewaka Ekanoa, meaning conservation of the land, a canoe we're all in. We all have to work together to conserve the environment, use less plastic, use less carbon, and just generally protect wildlife. So Kaitia Kotonga is the Maori belief of protection of land, stewardship of the land, uh, conservation essentially. Hewaka, uh, a canoe. Ekanoa, which is we're all in. So we're all in that canoe together. We all have to work together uh, to conserve the land. All right, so let's get to the questions. Are volcanoes in New Zealand? Uh, this is a country made of volcanoes. I literally pass 11 of them just getting to the office each day. Uh, it's pretty amazing. When I first moved here, I asked my flatmate, why is it so windy right here? And she said, oh, it's because we don't have volcanoes guarding us. And what is that supposed to mean? And so I googled where volcanoes are in Auckland alone, and there are 53 volcanoes in Auckland. Uh, and then there's hundreds more all throughout the country. So yeah, it's a country made of volcanoes, especially right here in Auckland. Trenton asks, why do penguins hate light? So they don't strictly hate light. Um, it's kind of more the context that the light's in. So they only come on shore at night, and they're expecting it to be dark. If they see light, they get kind of confused, just just like humans are kind of afraid of the dark because we don't know what's going on in it. They do the same with light because they're not expecting there to be light. So even on like really brightly lit, like full moon nights, even then they're a bit cautious to go on land. Um, so it's kind of the same thing whenever you bring artificial human-made light. And then that's the second bit of it. Whenever there's light, that then illuminates us, and they say, oh, there's a human here, and they're thinking of us as a predator, uh, which kind of are because we're, we're picking them up and handling them, and they're not big fans of that. Uh, yeah, so they're afraid of us, and they run away based on that. So it's not the light itself, it's that it's surprising and scary to them, as well as that it eliminates the humans, who are actually kind of a threat to them. Mark asks, what kind of ocean is that? So it's not an ocean, uh, kind of like the Gulf of Mexico is part of the Atlantic, kind of. Um, it's the Horaki Gulf, and the Horaki Gulf is part of the Pacific, kind of. <laughs> Olivia Poole says, I want to steal the penguins. Shouldn't do that. But yes, me too. Kerrigan asks, does the GPS hurt them, and how long does they, do they stay on them? Uh, no, it doesn't hurt them. It might be a bit uncomfortable, because we have to tape under the feathers. All you do is kind of slip the tape under the feathers and then wrap around the GPS tracker. Um, so it might be kind of like lightly tugging at your hair, like that amount of discomfort, but the feathers fall out all the time, so they're, it's not even as sensitive as that. Uh, so maybe it's a bit of discomfort, but it's not really pain. Some of them kind of like picked at it for a little bit, but most of them just got used to it and went about their day. So they didn't seem to mind it that much. And how long do they stay on them? So the longest we have between attaching it and recovering it, because we have to recover the trackers, they don't just stay on them forever. Um, that was eight days apart. No, seven days, seven days apart. And so we're thinking that's about the extent it would be because that one was just like barely hanging on by a thread. So it'd probably be a week or two and the trackers would just kind of fall off on their own. And then also the penguins each year, they molt all their feathers. And that's in like January to March, they lose all their feathers and grow all new ones. So that's the longest it could theoretically be. Even if we attached it as strong as possible that it would never fall off, it would still come off when they molt in January to March. And we did this one in late November. So the very most it would be would be like a couple months. But we aren't trying to make it that permanent, we're just trying to have it be about a week, because we can't just sit out on the island for months waiting for them to come back. How much do the penguins weigh? So the lighter ones are about 800 grams, which is about 2 pounds, and the heavier ones are 1100 grams, which is like 2.5 pounds or so. Yeah, they're, they're really little. It kind of varies by season and by sex and breeding stage and all those sorts of things, but it's about a kilogram in general, which is again about 2 pounds. Jaslyn asks, what's the debate on whether the penguins are the same species? Uh, so that one, I'm, I've been thinking about doing a full video on that for a long time, I actually filmed one back in October. But then we had some complications where we found new evidence on the species division, so it's a really complicated topic, and I probably will be doing a video on that soon. It's one that I've been wanting to do for a long time. Uh, so, just briefly, the little summary of what it is. The Australian ones are slightly bigger, slightly brighter colored, and they behave very differently from the Oteroa ones. So they breed twice in a season, whereas the Oteroa ones only breed once, and they come on shore all at once each night, and so the Oteroa ones that are like one over here, one over here, two over here, one over here, kind of spread out and not all at once. So they behave very differently, they breed very differently, uh, they even have accents essentially that are different. Uh, their calls are, you can think of it as the same language but a different accent, kind of British to American English, where it'd be like slightly different, you could understand each other but it's a bit different. Uh, so vocalize different, breed different, uh, behave different, and slightly apparent, slightly different in appearance. But I'll go into more detail of that in another video. It's just some people think they're different species, some people think they're just a subspecies. But I'll go into that in more detail later. Can you and your team do a cameo vid? We want to meet them. Uh, so Adeli is actually back in France. Uh, she was just down here for a few projects, so I don't know, maybe you can have her film something. <laughs> I'm not sure. Uh, Carrie, maybe, if she wants to. Uh, still working with her a lot. And then Eden and some of the other people that I work with from time to time. Yeah, they're all still down here. Maybe if they want to participate, uh, I can ask them. Kendall says, hi, it's Kendall. Hey, what's up, Kendall? Just wanted to say hi, and you should come back to SMA soon. Uh, I actually will be visiting Corpus. I think it's in the summer, though. I think it'll be after school's out, but yeah, I'll be back there. Uh, later this year. Andres asks, how long does it take to attach a GPS and how many birds did you catch? 
Uh, so the first one we attached took like 15 minutes, but that's including like collecting the feathers and taking all the body measurements, all those sorts of things. So that's about 15 minutes when we first did it. By the end, we got it down to like six minutes to do the whole thing. And the GPS tracking is probably only half of that. So I'd say it was like seven or eight minutes when we first began and down to like three or four minutes towards the end of the trip. Uh, not that long. Whenever you're doing blood work, you want to keep it less than seven minutes so that their blood isn't impacted by the stress of being handled. So that's kind of the target time and GPS tracking takes longer than the blood draws. So we're kind of hitting the marks of how quickly you want to get it done. And just in general, we don't want the, the birds to be bothered that much. Uh, so it's good that we've gotten the time down that much. And it was it only took, you know, two or three birds to get in the swing of it. You could hear in the last one, Carrie saying, oh, we're getting, we're getting hang of it or something along those lines. Uh, and that was because we were starting to get it down to like five minutes. And how many birds do you catch? So we didn't catch every bird that came on shore because by the end we had a lot of them and we were starting to have the marks on them wear off so we weren't just catching every bird we saw. Uh, so we let quite a few go slip on by. But in total, I think we got body measurements and feathers from 45. We attached GPS trackers to 23 of those 45. We know for sure at least 30 other individuals went by without us uh, handling them, but some of those 30 might have been like caught a few times or might have gone by us multiple times. Uh, of those 23, we got 14 trackers back, which is better than expected. You don't get all the trackers back. And of those 14, 11 of the trackers worked. So we caught 45 birds in total, GPS tracker, 23 of them, and got 11 tracks out of those. So it was actually a really successful trip. I know that sounds like a really low percentage, but we only had 23 trackers, so that was kind of our limit. Uh, and you expect less than half of them to come back. In some other projects we've done, like with Pakapu or uh, Gannets, these things, um, you get less than half back. That's kind of what's expected. Isaac asked, do you put the trackers on the penguins? Uh, if you mean you as the team, as the group, yes, uh, we put trackers on the penguins, uh, so we get those tracks that we showed the last time. Uh, if you mean me personally, not on that trip, but on some other projects, yes, I do the actual attaching. Uh, so for that one, we were kind of playing to our strengths. So me, I'm the athlete, and I'm the one that has the most experience like actually catching the birds, so that was kind of my role. We, we all kind of played every role, but that was my main thing, was catching the birds and bringing them over to the camp to get the GPS tracker put on them. Adeli, being a veterinarian, has the most experience with like monitoring the birds, making sure they're still healthy, they're doing fine, uh, and if she saw anything that was scaring her, saying, oh, the bird might not be doing so well, she would be able to say, okay, we, we need to let this one go, we, we don't need to put a tracker on it, we should just let it leave. Uh, so that was her thing, she was handling the bird and monitoring its health. And then uh, Carrie, because she's the one that set up the trackers and this was uh, essentially her project, this is for her masters, it's gonna be part of my PhD, but it's the entirety of her masters. So this was her thing, she set up the trackers and all that, so she was the one actually wrapping the GPS trackers and attaching them and all that. So she had the most experience with it and we were just playing to our strengths. Me catching the birds, Adeli handling and watching the birds, and then carry attaching the trackers and taking the measurements and those things. But we all kind of did each role at some point. Hi, my name is Camilla and I'm new and I thought I would say hi. Hey, what's up Camilla? Hope you enjoy the penguin stuff. Send these videos to, to y'all pretty regularly. Nikki Morris says, ha ha ha, the penguin reminds me of myself, miss you. Oh my, they really are Nikki. They're tiny, spastic, funny, kind of annoying, but in an endearing way, they are Nikki. Marina asked, how much fish does a penguin eat on a daily basis? So no one's ever done a study on like amount. They've just done studies on what they're eating because they don't necessarily just come back each night. It might be from several trips and it's pretty seasonally variable. So it would be tough to just say, they always bring back 300 grams, they always bring back 500 grams. It's always this much fish, this much squid. It's really variable. But in general, it's gonna be a few hundred grams of a mix of fish, plankton, krill, and squid. So like maybe 10% to 30% of their body weight. So it's kind of like if a human was eating like 10 to 40 pounds of food a day. Also, why are seabirds so shy when it comes to light? So all the things that I hear said, uh, responding to the question from Trenton about why the penguins hate light, but also, it's kind of the opposite. Most seabirds are attracted to light. It's just in the context of those penguins, they're afraid of it because it shows a human and it's unexpected. Whereas like lighthouses, a really common issue with lighthouses is seabirds running into them. Or like normal houses, seabirds just running into them. And the seabirds are attracted to that because many seabirds that fly around at night are looking for bioluminescent uh, food, food that lights up at night. So they might be thinking it's food, they might be trying to follow the moon or uh, reflections of waves, we're not totally sure, but a lot of them actually are attracted to light. It was just in the context of those penguins right there that they were afraid of the humans and the unexpected aspect of a light. When there are breaks in the tracking system, are the penguins teleporting? Yes, the teleporters in Star Trek are actually loosely based off penguins, believe it or not. No, uh, the tracker only turns on every 15 minutes or so, so if they're too deep underwater for the GPS tracker to, uh, to ping off the satellite, then you wouldn't get a mark for that point, so it would be the next time that they're uh, high enough in the water column at the 15 minute mark. It's about 10 meters is the deepest that it would be able to do it, so if they're on a really deep dive, they can go down to about 30 meters or so, uh, is a usual deep dive. If they're that deep during the time that the tracker wants to ping off the satellite, then you're not going to get a mark and you're just going to get the next one. Or it could be they genuinely did just go really, really far in those 15 minutes and 
you've just seen them do with this mad spree. Colton says, Hola, mi amigo. <laughs> Hola, Colton, como estas? Easton asks, is there a flu outbreak there? Uh, no. So keep in mind, opposite seasons, and flu usually has its big outbreak in the fall and winter. We're in the summer right here, so we aren't having a bad flu outbreak. Also, uh, like in most countries, uh, healthcare is free here, so everyone gets their flu shots, so the flu isn't nearly as much of a problem here. And Easton also asks, how much did the thermal camera cost? So I'm very glad I didn't personally pay for the thermal camera. We have two of them, one from the university and one from the Seabird Trust. I think the cheaper one was the Seabird Trust one, and it was about five or six grand. And the more expensive one was the university's one, and that was like eight grand. That's New Zealand dollars. So in American, it would be like 4,000 and 6,000, I think. But still, yeah, very expensive. But it's essentially necessary to work with Seabirds, especially the Seabirds that you can only access at night. Uh, they're quiet, they're sneaky, and they're only at night, and you don't want to scare them with the lights. So, yeah, necessary ex expense, but I'm very glad I'm not the one that paid it. Trevor asks, what is the rarest species of organism you have seen or found? So it's probably the New Zealand storm petrel. Uh, there's only ever been one egg documented. We know kind of where they breed now, and there's, I think, 100 individuals have been banded, or had the little tags put on them, but only one egg ever. So they're probably the rarest species I've ever seen. Takahe are also extremely rare, but every single one of them is documented. Like, we know where all 340 or so of them are. Uh, same thing with the kakapo, but I've never actually seen a kakapo. Uh, yeah, so there's some extremely rare species down here. New Zealand storm petrel being probably the rarest, but we're not totally sure, and that's one I've actually seen in the wild. Lily P asked, have you had a scary snake encounter on the islands that you visit? So there's no snakes in this country. There's literally no dangerous animals in this country other than the one animal I had a close encounter with, which is the Kekano, or the fur seal, that I almost accidentally stumbled across till Carrie was like, oh, there's a seal there, don't run over it. Um, yeah, so there's nothing dangerous on land at all. Like, there's no snakes, there's no scorpions. Um, there are some wild pigs that humans introduced, but that's only in some areas, and they aren't, like, as sneaky and dangerous as snakes are. There's not really a lot to worry about uh, at all. But yeah, the Kekano was a close call, and I think that would be about the only thing I'd be, like, genuinely worried about running into. Arya asked, do you consider the job you do hard? Um, so hard in terms of how much effort you have to put in, like how much time and effort. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, any PhD is a lot of work. You're expected to work more than full time. You're expected to constantly have your mind going. So it is kind of exhausting in that way. Uh, I find the laboratory work difficult in terms of like sometimes struggling to do it, regardless of how much effort is put in. Um, just because I'm not naturally a laboratory indoor type person. I walk into a lab and see a bunch of chemicals everywhere, and my mind just shuts down. Um, so for that one, I'm very grateful for the people in my lab that are much more, much more inclined to do that sort of stuff. So a lot of the methods for that have already been figured out. A lot of the people working on it are willing to help. It's really a community effort. You work together. I'm good at the fieldwork aspect, so I help the people that are better at lab work with that. People that are better at lab work help me with the lab work stuff. Uh, yeah, and then the fieldwork, it really comes naturally to me. Like, I was generally shocked how naturally it came to me. Just setting up field projects, figuring out where to go, how to design it, those sorts of things. Um, so that one's not difficult in terms of how hard it is, but it is difficult in terms of how much effort you have to put in. Uh, getting out to these islands, physically demanding, uh, mentally exhausting, yeah. Uh, but that's true for any PhD project. Riley asks, are the penguins colorblind? Uh, no, they're not. This is actually a common misconception about birds, is that they're blind to red. Uh, there are some birds that cannot see red light. Uh, like kiwi are a great example. Whenever my family visited, we used a red light to go looking for kiwi, so they don't know we're coming. And that is true for some birds, but not for Corora. And presumably for other penguins, because the more closely related to something you are, the more similar basic functions, like vision, are going to be similar. So they actually did a study in Australia with the Australian penguins, where they set up these five tunnels that blocked off the entrance along the main path the penguins take to get to their burrows. Uh, and those five tunnels each had different lights in them. Either no light, just plain normal white light, and then red, blue, and green. And the penguins preferred to go through the blue tunnel, and they preferred to go to lit tunnels over unlit tunnels. So that says they want to go to light when it's available, and blue is the most visible to them. Red was their least favorite of the lit tunnels, but they still went through it, and other things show evidence. I mean, even just like bringing out the red light whenever we're doing work, it shows they can see the red light, just not as strongly as they can see other things. Uh, and this might also be feeding off just another misconception. Colorblind doesn't mean seeing grayscale, and dogs aren't colorblind. I know they're the famous, most famous colorblind ones, but they're not colorblind. They just see different and fewer colors than us. What color is the penguin's poo? Uh, so penguins and all birds don't really have poo the way mammals do. This is going to be a weird discussion, just disclaimer right here. It's going to be a weird discussion. Birds don't poo, and they don't pee. They make one kind of combined soupy thing. <laughs> you can see where I'm going. Like, this is weird. Um, you can tell what they eat based on the color. So it's not always the same thing. If they're eating a lot of phytoplankton or plant plankton, it's going to be kind of greenish. If they're eating a lot of zooplankton, which is like animal plankton, it's going to be kind of orangish. If they're eating a lot of fish and squid, it's going to be kind of whitish cream colored. So it kind of depends on what they've been eating the most. And the funny thing here is other seabirds, it's even more extreme than the penguins. And that's how uh, one of my colleagues, Eden, is going to be designing her PhD, is around the color of the poo and comparing it with vomit. So she's going to be making birds vomit and poo for her PhD to find out what these birds are eating. Um, yeah, it's going to be a really interesting project. She starts that next month. 
But yeah, you can actually tell a lot from the color of the poo, and it's not always the same. And obviously you have to follow up a good old poo discussion with what food do I eat here? So I pretty much eat the same wherever I go, uh, the same as I ate in Texas and in Ireland. Uh, I eat pretty much like rice and beans with salsa or uh, sriracha. Um, that's pretty much why I eat wherever I go. That's just what I like best. It's cheap, it's nutritious, it's delicious. Um, but whenever I'm like eating out, it's kind of very British food here. A lot of like fish and chips and meat pies and those sorts of things, which I'm not as big a fan of, um, but I'm still totally cool with it. Like those are good. And is there American food there? So I'm not strictly sure what American food is. Is that like Tex-Mex? Is it barbecue? Is it burgers and pizza? I mean, those are kind of what comes to mind for stereotypical American foods. And yeah, those are all available here, but it's much more British food. It's like meat pies and fish and chips and stuff. But yeah, there are burgers and pizza. And there's kind of Tex-Mex, but it's, it's actually pretty bad. They have really mild salsa, like spicy food's not a thing here. So that's kind of not the best. Yeah. Um, so if you stay off the Mexican food, like the American style burgers and uh, chips and those things are good, I guess. Alexis asks, how many days are you staying there? Um, if you meant out on the island, we were there for nine days and eight nights. I actually filmed that back in November. Like I didn't send you all the video uh, as I was doing it. I filmed that back in November, but then I had field work for like three months straight. So I never had time to put it into a video and send it to you. Uh, so we were there for nine days back in November. Brooklyn Teeter says, hey, hey Brooklyn. Ethan asked, how fluffy are the penguins? The adults are not fluffy at all. Just keep in mind, they have to be waterproof. They have to be streamlined for going through the water. So they're not fluffy at all. They're all. They almost feel scaly, like how like streak their feathers are. Um, like they're pretty rough, but the babies are super fluffy when they still have their down feathers, but they're just like in a fluffy coat. That's it's really adorable. Alexis K asks, how long have you been discovering things and traveling? Uh, so all of us are constantly discovering things. Like every day you go out and learn something new, but in terms of how long I've been like on the road away from Corpus and traveling around sciencing and discovering things, um, probably since I finished my undergraduate back at the end of 2015, I then traveled around for about a year and then lived in Ireland, um, and then traveled around a bit more. And then I was with y'all for a while there in Corpus. So I think other than that time I was there in Corpus, it's been since like the end of 2015, I've been kind of on the road. McKinley asks, when you went swimming or snorkeling, did you see any turtles? Not on that trip, but on some other ones out to Pocahina, we've been seeing green, yeah, we've been seeing green sea turtles, uh, which are the same species that are the most common there in Corpus. But on that trip, we saw tons of stingrays, just tons of them, they were everywhere. Uh, saw some dolphins, but not while I was actually in the water. Um, saw Kekano or the fur seal, but not while I was in the water, because when we saw them around, you don't want to get in, because they're potentially dangerous. I was hoping to see penguins in the water, but didn't. Uh, Carrie, who was there on the trip with me, she actually saw penguins in the water in the Galapagos. While she was snorkeling, she saw Galapagos penguins and was just swimming along with them. She was amazed how fast they are, and they kind of let out a jet of bubbles as they're going along, like, they look like they're just zooming right by. Kinley asks, what's your favorite color? Ooh, probably either blue or green. I don't know. I don't really think about that a lot. I guess blue or green, just kind of nature-y colors. I don't know. <laughs> and Carly H says, hi, don't forget to stay hydrated. I will. I will stay hydrated. All right. Thanks for all those questions. Um, Jaslyn's question, I will be making a video at some point soon about the species question. Uh, it's a really complicated topic that can't really fit in on like a normal Q&A thing. And it has been one I've been thinking of for a long time and actually filmed at one point. I just wasn't happy with how it went. And then we got new evidence. So it's complicated. I'll be getting a more full question to you, Jaslyn, soon enough. Sorry <laughs> that I didn't give like a full answer here. But thanks for all the questions. I'll see you all later.